First off, have you played Return of the... Wait, I mean, have you seen Return of the King, the Lord of the Rings film? If so, what do you think of the series in general? I've heard you say you think the movies are better than the books. I might have heard it wrong, but I'd like to hear your opinion on it. First of all, I have to nitpick the game. You never, ever, ever pull a bowstring back and, and let it go without having an arrow knocked. You never do that. That can ruin the bow. I know about bows. Um, okay, so <laughs> and then so I'll answer the question. So first of all, there's probably a lot of people going like, "Woo, the movies are better than the books." Um, I don't really like Lord of the Rings books. I don't haven't, despite having written some fantasy. Um, and just to be clear, my my books were were meant to be very very commercial. Like they're not supposed to be high art or or like, hey, let's let's go win the the Pulitzer Prize with my bullshit. Like they were written for money. You know, like some some of those stories I wrote in a day you know like that that's the kind of level that we're talking about and they they did make money they did their purpose um it was some of the later one of the later ones when i got into it so I, I i hate to have to say that shit but like having written fantasy myself and then to say hey i don't really like lord of the rings i don't really like most fantasy that people write um i find that lord of the rings has poisoned the well for that shit and we have george r, r. martin you know like who has to write in the same way as Tolkien so much that he added those same two R, R initials in the middle of his name. Like, come on, J.R.R.R. Tolkien and George R.R. Martin. Like, come on, George. Come on, what are you doing? Uh, <laughs> such a dumb joke. Anyway, uh, so, like, I, I feel like a lot of it is bogged down with just unnecessary description and just bullshit about the history of the world. Um, and I really did not like Lord of the Rings for that. I did, however, really like The Hobbit. The Hobbit wasn't like that. I read The Hobbit a long time ago, I think almost 20 years ago now. And right after reading The Hobbit, I tried to read Lord of the Rings and I was really disappointed because I really liked The Hobbit. Um, my favorite fantasy writers uh, are uh, Robin Hobb and now uh, Andrei Sapow Sapkowski. Sapkowski, there we go, Sapkowski. Um, Sapkowski has a very direct writing style. He d doesn't waste much time with the superfluous bullshit of setting the scene like Tolkien and, and Martin do. Uh, Robin Hobb does it a little bit, but I feel like she's way more focused on characters and just getting to the point. So I don't really enjoy uh, I don't really enjoy that. So I didn't really enjoy the books for that reason. I felt like they had way too many details in them, and I don't really like a lot of fantasy for that. I prefer sci-fi, because sci-fi writers haven't been poor poisoned by Tolkien. I don't know why. There's a lot of overlap with fantasy and science fiction. In fact, a lot of people tend to think that there shouldn't be that big of a distinction between them. So I prefer the movies uh, greatly to the books, but the movies aren't my favorite either. Uh, I prefer, I think Fellowship was my favorite, but you have to understand, and I, I, I've told the story at least once before on stream, um, you have to understand that uh, I, I'm, I've always been a hipster. This isn't a, this isn't a recent thing. I've always... <laughs> I'm not really a hipster. However, things can be spoiled for me. So if you have a friend and that friend is incessantly like, you know, you have to watch this, this is so good. And then like some of the other friends in your group get into the same thing. Um, Lily experienced this in high school with Harry Potter. You and know? Lord of the Rings. And Lord of the Rings. the same person who loved Harry Potter wanted to be an elf. Yeah. And asked me once if her ears were pointed enough that she could pass. Yeah. She kind of wrecks it for you. Yeah. She was, uh, she was really weird. Um, yeah, she was really, really weird. <laughs> uh, anyway, so uh, it, it, it can get to the point where things can get spoiled for you. And Lord of the Rings was that. It was my version of Harry Potter for, for Lily's um, experience. And Star Wars 2, I, I had a friend who would recite Star Wars, even the alien parts, and he was proud of it. Like, he knew the whole script. He had memorized the whole thing. And I had only watched the movies once, and I liked them, but it was kind of like, yeah, they're good, but they're they're not like the best thing ever. So I was kind of put off with Star Wars, but then they did the same thing to, to Lord of the Rings, and it just kind of got really obnoxious. But honestly, that wouldn't be enough to, to ruin it. It was that I saw them in the theaters, and for the second movie, it was the only, only available tickets were 
literally front row and I don't know how theaters this was in Britain so I don't know how the how the theaters work over here now Lily and I haven't gone to the theaters in a long time because of, we have uh, the kids um, there's that there's the front row that you go into the theater right and you turn like right or left into it after you come in through like the little hall that has the garbage can and you go there and you, and as you stand at the end of that hall you can look down and there's like seats that go all the way up to the ceiling and then there's seats that go all the way down to to the to the screen and there's like a little walkway between those two sections you know what i mean when i say we were front row i mean we were front row in the section that went down toward the screen like we weren't next to the door we went even deeper into the theater so i couldn't even see the the whole screen because we were also on the edge of the of the movie of the of the, of the front row and we couldn't see i couldn't even see the whole screen while craning my neck painfully back neck the, the whole done. fucking movie because my dipshit friends who were like oh the rings is just the best thing ever fucking i i want to be gandalf when i grow up no i want to be aragorn mur, 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 mur. here i'm gonna say the star wars here. oochie boochie nipple pinchy you know like, <laughs> like, like it's like we we couldn't wait for the next showing no we have to go see yeah, and it's like so that kind of ruined that experience for me of, of seeing the second movie and whenever I watch it I always remember that ever uh, forever um, so I would say that I, I enjoyed the third one but the third one has this like the day of sex machina not to spoil it which kind of pissed me off and would just piss me off in the books too because apparently it's exactly the same in the books that that was so bad that day of sex machina is so bad that even my friends were like yeah it's kind of crap um, do I need do I need spoiler warning for that? The the ghosts. There we go. Like if if you've watched, it, you know what I'm saying. If if you haven't watched it, that's not gonna really mean shit to you. The ghosts. But like I was like, oh okay, this was a, this was a fake situation. Um, so the eagles didn't really bother me and so we we went through that and so i would still say that i enjoyed the movies more i i really liked fellowship and then after that eh, um return of the king probably my second favorite um because we weren't in the fucking front row and forever with my neck still hurting to this day you know not bitter um, about it at not, all not bitter about it at all and you know didn't you didn't we didn't even have time to get popcorn lily Lily, we didn't have. I know the look on your face right now. I know. Like, why did we even? Why bother did you going? even go? Yeah, we did because because we have to. If we're gonna miss the show. Like, okay, you go. You get your seat. Someone leaves a coat. You go back. Like, you don't go to a movie with no popcorn. Didn't even have popcorn. And you get the largest one so that you can eat it for dinner later. Yeah. So I was I was pretty pissed. So th so there we go. Um, movie popcorn is like my favorite snack ever. But yeah, I I, uh, I I think that the movies are better and I'm sad that I don't enjoy the books, but I want to try it again because like I said, it's been 20 years and I am, I'm 34 in November. Um, so it wasn't exact, well, actually it might have been exactly 20 years. I'm trying to think. So I think, I think, yeah, it was like, like I was 13 when I read The Hobbit. Yeah. So I think, I think about. Oh, false air. You gotta pace yourself, think, man. Think about 13. You gotta have some, and then otherwise you get too thirsty, and then you wind up peeing the whole movie away. You have to pace yourself on the popcorn. Thirsty or thirsty? Thirsty. Thirsty? Wow. It's business. Okay. It's not cute. <laughs> anyway, so sorry I don't have a much more of a... Uh, of a strong opinion to to give you on uh, on the books and the movies i haven't watched them since uh lily and i should watch them again at some point the i haven't seen all of them to be honest i've seen parts of them the extended versions all, all of them, them in a row which will still be shorter than the witcher video <laughs> hashtag, with butter hashtag, hashtag is he kidding or not ha 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 and then we'll uh we'll see how they hold up as as an adult but i should also read the books again and give them another try and i still haven't even finished um the stephen king's jfk book i really want i started that and uh, i was enjoying it i wasn't loving it but i was enjoying it i got really really mad at at, at the character at the main character i got so pissed and then i put it down and i um and I uh, and I forgot to pick it back up again after that, even though I was enjoying it. This is a minor spoiler, but like he, he can go like it's the premise of the book is that he can go back in time, and uh, he goes back in time and he um, he realizes that he's that he's gonna stay there for a while, and he realizes that he's accidentally brought his cell phone with him, and he can go back into the back into the portal and go back to the future and then come back to the past and it resets with no issue whatsoever like he could just reset it and not bring the phone but instead of that he's too lazy and he throws the he throws the cell phone into a pond 
and and it sinks to the bottom of the pond and he's like yep that's that done that's not gonna start come back to bite me in the ass and i just closed the book and i went you fucking idiot i don't even know if it's important but i'm like you fucking idiot and i didn't read it again after that but like i, I would like to because that's not enough to, to put me off i just i just said i just did the fucking idiot thing and then i got distracted by something um but yeah i'd like to i'd like to um runes durability what the fuck is a rune i would like to uh read the dark tower series I've, i haven't read any of that but yeah i have a lot of um a lot of uh books to read at the moment have you read the chronicles of amber by roger zelazny none of them are my favorite books but i think it is my favorite series of all time isn't it zelanzi maybe it's spelled wrong or maybe it's wrong in my head i, I don't know how to say it i'm just guessing i actually have read that and that is one of the examples of a fantasy book it's on done the bookshelf, right isn't it I don't yeah remember. i've seen that that is one of the that is one of the, the uh, an examples of a fantasy book done right i actually have read that and it was interesting and it, and it avoids that trap of it being um of it being about to bog down all the different details and everything um apart from that the story i i only read the first half um there it's a it's 10 books in one and they're kind they're quite short but all put together the book is fucking huge um and i read the first five and i haven't read the second five yet it was a while ago when i when i read it um and i i enjoyed that quite a bit uh, it does this interesting thing it, it breaks a rule so one of my one of the, one of the things i think should be a rule for writing and i think most writers would agree with this is that you should never dump a bunch of characters in a row with all of their descriptions and all of their kind of like features in a list you should never introduce more than a few names at once and even then you you, you should try to introduce characters on an individual basis because it, it's very difficult to for the reader to to imagine different ones especially if you want them to have a very unique description i usually don't describe my characters because in my experience whenever i i see a name and a profession even I, like or immediately boom the image of that character is cemented in my head forever and it doesn't matter what you say like if the writer says he had green eyes and in my original thought it had brown eyes doesn't matter it doesn't matter one fucking bit like if you say it multiple times that, that, that they had green eyes maybe you can get through to me but like it's like doesn't fucking matter like it's in my head now i'm i'm not changing it fuck you and roger zelanzi um uh, has this uh, in in one of the first pages? I think in the first like twenty or thirty pages, um, he describes I think at least five characters in in the form of a deck of cards. The main character finds because they're all like supernatural entities, and he finds a deck of cards, and they're all like I think they're kind of like tarot cards, and their descriptions and the names of all these characters. I think the characters brothers and sisters. Um, I can't really remember it well. It was a long time ago I read the book, and uh, it's just like one after the other. So 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 and so looks like this. Boom. So 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 and so looks like this. Boom. And what I and I hated that at first. I was like, I'm not going to remember this. But then I realized I could just go to the top of that page and dog ear it. And whenever the character came back, I really enjoyed that I could just flip back to that page right again. And there there it is. Just like just like a resource for me to remind myself who this character is. I didn't have to go digging through back to all the pages. So I thought that was kind of a cool thing that, that he did. Like he broke what I consider to be a rule. And it worked out well in the end. Because I was like, oh, cool. You know, like that's, 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 uh, that's good. Yeah, uh, I, I'd like to read the, the next five. Yeah, I enjoyed it. There's some really weird imagery in that. It's like, um, they're like realm walkers and they can go between different dimensions and they can also dream up things, but it's not really clear if they're dreaming things up or if everything in, uh, that they can think of already exists and they're just kind of traveling there. And there's these really weird travel scenes where it's almost like they're they're moving between like a morphing painting around them. It was, it was quite well des described. It was interesting. No need to answer if too political. Uh-oh. <clears throat> dun, dun, dun. People tend to react heavily to criticism on things they like and have invested a large amount of time and money into it. Games and brands can be such a thing, but in the end, both are still products which can be criticized and analyzed. Do you think that the rise in atheism led many people to replace their traditional belief system with brands and specific investments? Uh, absolutely, yes. Yep, strong yes. No doubt in my mind. Um, yep, for sure. And that's why uh, uh, atheists are the worst. Even though I am th the most atheist person in the world, I'm the atheist. Oh, I see what you did there. <laughs> Uh, actually, I think I'm a, I'm more agnostic than atheist. I think I, I'm uh, more atheist than you are. 
I, uh, I, I think there could be something that's kind of like, effectively kind of like a god. If we're all in a simulation kind of thing. There, like, there could be something like a god. Um, but I don't think there is a god that made made the universe in in the supernatural, you know, gray beard or ball of energy way. Like I don't I don't think that. But yeah, um, yeah, for sure. And uh, part of what I'm about to say is mostly coming from reading uh, *Sapiens* by oh god, Yuval Noah. Noah oh, Harari. Yuval Noah Harari. Uh, reading *Sapiens* and the sequel to *Sapiens*, *Homo Deus*. So the idea that the dual nature of humans is a great benefit and that we're capable of holding contradictory ideas in our head and that can lead to some confusion sometimes and can also lead to some really strange uh, beliefs and arguments. You know, like you can have someone who's really into evidence-based logical research and they can still believe in God. There's this, like this really big conflict in that mind. They still function, they can still be productive and they don't think that there's anything wrong with that either. Also that we're all liars and there's no way of getting around that. And the fact that we are liars is a great benefit to our species. And it's just something that we should just accept and acknowledge, you know, like we shouldn't have deception, but we we just kind of lie. And there's it's also linked, I don't think he talks about this in the book, but I've, I've also linked it in my head with um, intrusive thoughts that, um, you know, you're playing, you're, you're watching something or, or you're playing some game and then just this scantily clad anime girl comes along and, you know, just really intrudes on the experience. No, uh, that you, that, that feeling that when you're at the edge of a cliff or, or you're on a bridge or anything and there's a little voice in the back of your head that's like, jump, or, you know, like you're in front of a fire and, and there's a thought in, in your head that's like, hey, what if you just stuck your hand in, what would happen? You know, like there's this unpredictability to our species that can lead us to be very creative and very inventive and it, it's matched with this okay we can we can hold conflicting ideas in our heads we can lie and be very creative about it and we're constantly pushing that boundary and also we have these intrusive thoughts that sometimes people are just going to be like you know what fuck it i'm doing it you know like and and, and that sort of thing uh but the other idea he talks about in the books both of them actually because um i was a little disappointed in, in homo deus because compared to sapiens i felt like he was just going oh he just wrote the same book again uh it wasn't until the the end and a short bit in the beginning that i felt was really different different than anything else. I felt like it was just exactly the same as Sapiens, just told in a different way. Probably because he has the same focus on historical examples. Yeah, I was a little disappointed. However, th there's a section in his book that's called the, A Brief History of Lawns, and that completely changed my perception of the phrase, those who don't know history are doomed to repeat it. That is something that I've always assumed that it's like, if you don't understand history, you're going to make the same mistakes that we've learned from history. And that's not actually what that means. It means that things are set in a certain way and you might not understand why we do things in the way that we do them without studying history and realizing why. And he talks about lawns and why we keep lawns and he, and he linked that to a brief history of lawns. And that's probably, um, no joke, one of the most important things that I've ever read that resonated with me like right away. It was like, oh, holy shit, I now understand something that I really didn't before that I thought I already did. So there you go, Joe's capable of learning. So I was happy with that. That was worth the price of admission just, just alone, you know, even though the book was a Christmas present. Thank you, Lily. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, humans also collectively go in for myths and sometimes those myths will be religion and gods and sometimes it can be corporations and we will all agree that these things exist when they don't and there are all these rules and and there's no real objectivity in, in a lot of things that we do you know like there was recently a comment i got on one of the streams i can't remember what it was it was something about how like if everyone agreed on the planet that we should murder this one person that doesn't mean that the murder is okay and it's like well actually it does because there is no there is no justice there is no objective morality that doesn't exist there's that um that quote from, I believe it's Terry Pratchett who said, you know, like, if you if you grind down the whole universe and you put it through through a sieve or you put, put it to a filter of everything, uh, there will not be one one molecule of justice, no molecule, no molecule of, of morality, no molecule of truth. The, the, these things don't exist. They only exist in our heads. And we've made those things happen, you know? So... <sighs> 
it's it's always interesting to talk to someone who, who thinks that murder is wrong no matter what when they also believe in prisons it's like okay well if you don't if you don't believe murder is ever ever right like are you okay with with prisons like do you, do you think everyone no one should be in prison because sometimes it, it's justified um and I, that's kind of being semantic like I, like it depends on what he means you know or wh whoever wants to make the argument means i also don't believe in the death penalty you know like I, I don't really think that's a good thing but at the same time to make it a moral thing mm, that's a hard sell for me but anyway it's linked to this idea of myths and harari talks about corporations a lot in in the book and how there are these myths of of uh, these entities that don't really exist but we all pretend to because we bought into the myth of of coca-cola we bought into the myth of um of uh, Ferrari, you know, like Porsche, you know, what is the company? Is it the product that they make? Well, no, if there were all, all the, all the, Porsches were destroyed tomorrow that company would still exist and it's like okay well is it the, is it the people that live there uh, like work for there well no there's no one person that you could remove or you know like all or the factories or anything like this this company that that's been entrenched now is it, it exists in the minds of everyone that that's what it is and it's kind of an, an interesting idea and it, it doesn't really all make that much sense at the beginning but at the end I was like huh you know what you've convinced me and I think that that idea of collective myths that we buy into and we become invested into happens with art as well probably not as not near as as um as strongly but yeah I, I think it does and i think that's that's replaced a lot of the belief systems and and the the um the sense of community that religion used to offer i think that we need it like as, as much as i said at the beginning like i am very atheist i was one of those edgelord atheists when i was uh when I was a teenager, like I wouldn't even go to one of my cousin's christenings because like, I don't believe in this shit. You're all fucking sheep. And I cringe my ass off when I think of that. And I feel so bad for my uncle when I wouldn't go because I was in that edgelord phase. Um, in, in my defense, I was, I was like, I was 19. <laughs> I was 12. Um, I just want to say 19 because it'd be funny. Um, I, like I, I cringe my ass off, but like I was, I was one of them. But I, I really do think that we need it. Like, like we need that sense of community. I'm jealous that that you know I didn't grow up with that sense of, of strong community that religion can bring. You know, like you, you can feel really connected to to a group, and I think we need that sort of thing. And I think that's that's sort of what has been replaced. Uh, as atheism has has gone up we need to replace that with something and it's like well it's the art that i like and um i think there's probably a a, a bigger discussion point to make uh that i'm not equipped to do and i don't know enough about uh which is that most of the conversations and interactions we have with other people nowadays are just like almost exclusively about the media that we consume it's all about like what book did you read what movie did you watch are you watching this tv show i need to watch game of thrones because i need to talk about it at the water cooler at work I need to be able to 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 talk about um Westworld and oh the new Watchmen show like I'm gonna be behind and I'm, I'm missing out and and that's because that's all the conversations are dominated by and honestly I kind of feel like politics has become the same thing politics has become media it's be it's become like a story that we follow and and people get really invested in the side that they've chosen and they don't really even care about the points anymore it's all about like I want my team to win over your team it's it's a sports match to them and it's like yeah yeah fuck you you know let's let's own the democrats let's own the republicans it's it's just all that shit and and i and it, i really feel like politics shouldn't be that because it's it's this is important stuff you know what i mean but it's like that's kind of what it has has turned into and maybe this is me being like in the in the the early stages of becoming an old man but i kind of feel like it wasn't that way when i was a kid not even when i was like like a young adult i feel like when i was a kid it wasn't that way or it wasn't that way like back um even before I was born with the stories that I've heard. But I think, I kind of suspect that this is maybe me becoming an old man. I, I, I really don't want it to be, but I kind of feel like it is. It's always been that way, and I'm just, like, finally finally realizing it now that I'm old enough to see it. But, yeah, so that's what I think. So I definitely agree. Yeah, I, I think it happens less with certain forms of media. I think it happens less with books. I think it happens a lot with video games. But video games are to uh, like our generation kind of kind of like a religion. Like I don't think again maybe I'm wrong. I I believe it or not I wasn't alive in the 50s, but I I don't think that movies and TV shows dominated people in the same way that games can dominate lives. Like even my life is so dominated with video games. Um, so I don't I don't know about that. I see it a little bit happening with with movies now more, um, especially with with the Marvel stuff. If you don't like the Marvel stuff, then you're shit, and I don't like you anymore. That sort of thing. Which, by the way, all of it is shit. So, uh, how 
How do you feel about filler in entertainment? TV shows have the most of it, especially shows with no end in sight, but filler can find its way into even the shortest of films, those that don't have a strong enough concept to explore the main plot for just 90 minutes without having irrelevant scenes and subplots. Anime is particularly er 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 egregious. Thank you. Here, with entire filler episodes. Egregregarious. That's a mouthful. Rather than single scenes, do you think filler has its place in storytelling? Should every scene in a show, movie, or book be vital to progressing the overall narrative? Is it okay if it provides a little more characterization at the expense of plot advancement? I personally found the most enjoyable Danganronpa episodes to be the first few filler ones in the prequel arc. What about filler in games? Good or bad? Is padding the length of your game ever justified? Wow, can you could you imagine enjoying the Denkerampa and the anime? God damn, Micah. Shocked and appalled. Uh, shocked Hurt and, and betrayed. I, I'm I'm questioning the quality of the sixth sense now. Uh no, I enjoy parts of it too. It was really cool to see those characters um like animated. Do you think that's why they call it anime? Because they're animated? Oh man! I'm with you because you say such brilliant things like this. Exactly. You just drop them. I think by definition that if it's good, then it's not filler. Do you know what I mean? Like if if it if it um, provides some great characterization and expands on those characters, then sort of by definition, it's it's not filler and it's not bad and it's worthwhile. You know? Kind of like that saying that wasted time isn't wasted if you enjoyed it. Yeah. So I, I think it's kind of like, yeah, it has to be based on whether it, it does contribute anything worthwhile to the to the overall story or not. I will say that not everything needs to need, needs to contribute to the overall narrative, and sometimes you can you can get a lot of value out of just scenes that are just to make characters better. But like if we use the Danganronpa uh, game example, so like your free time sets that you have with different characters, um, that is that is definitely not filler. Um, because you are getting to in, enjoy these characters and learn more about them. And in some cases, you might be spending more time with someone who then gets moited and um, you will feel that loss more having known them. In fact, I would say that um, the Danganronpa games would benefit from having even more free time and they should have made it optional and, and, and you should have been able to hang out with like everyone at least once you know like it would add a lot of time onto the game it'd be better if it was all voice acted but yeah i would say that's something that should happen you can pick and choose if you don't want to of course you just not force but yeah i would prefer more free time so yeah so again it kind of sounds like a cop-out and i'm sorry but it's like if it to me if if it's good and it does have a positive impact then then it's not filler um i think gameplay in games have the biggest detriment from filler because it can be so boring and sometimes it is optional, but sometimes it's really hard to tell if it is optional or not. Um, if you haven't played Witcher 3, in Skellige, there are these, these are, there are smuggler caches all throughout the ocean. And um, despite everyone thinking that Witcher 3 is just this god God's gift to gamers, um, Witcher 3 has a lot in common with Ubisoft style games. Uh, it's just instead of having towers that you go to to unlock areas, you just go to notice boards. And notice boards put point of interest on, points of interest on point of interest, points of interest on the map. And in Skellige, it puts, I think, I have an exact number somewhere, but I can't recall off the top of my head. I think it's like 50, 50 smuggler caches in the ocean. And these are nothing but just things that you go to and you jump off the boat, you dive down. Um, if, if you have tooltips turned on, then you'll know to shoot the drowners with your crossbow. If you have tooltips turned off like my dumbass did, then you'll just strategically swim around the drowners to get the treasure. Maybe you'll die and have to reload you know, in the boat a couple times before you learn on your on your fucking second playthrough that you know you can fucking shoot the crossbow under, underwater. Uh, but yeah, you can you do that. And it's like, okay, well, th this is clearly optional content, but then is it? Is it like there are points of interest? They're on the map. Some of the ones are, are around the, the 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 world have more interesting things to them. You know, it also has this this problem of okay, so it's pointing out all these all these places of interest on the map. So is this the only places where there are worthwhile things to do? Well, it turns out no. You have to read the map even more carefully, and there are lots of places on the map that have like quests in them even that don't show up as points of interest on the map and don't have any map markings at all. And you just have to just go there and explore, ignoring the points of 
of interest. So what if there's like a ghost ship in one of those points of interest or something really, really interesting? So like, I, I think it's clear that in, in most games that you shouldn't do all this stuff. Like I still did more for the experimental side of the game, you know, like I, I looted every single one of those things, um, but more for, like I said, just like figuring out how the game works rather than my own personal enjoyment. So yeah, it's, it's hard to do that, but like some, some games have filler combat. And again, I, I kind of feel like we're, but like, it's like they have lots of filler rooms where they just throw waves and waves of guys at you and, and just a bunch of bullshit that, you know, it's like, okay, well, they're, they're clearly passing adding for time here but technically if you fought one enemy once like is is are is the second goomba in in mario one you know one one is that filler content i've seen this before they're repeating content it's being recycled you know like that's bullshit like there's no way that you can expect the game to be like that so like where's the line between just exploring these game systems and having filler and i would guess that i would try to look at it from a perspective of are they using the same content in in a different way are the goombas arranged in a different in a different pattern with a different obstacle nearby with a different set of jumps and maybe there's more than one of them whereas in a game like control i felt like i was being sent the same wave of enemies in the same arrangement in the same looking room and doing the same battle over and over and over again with nothing really new so that's why i would say control has filler but for the most part a game like mario doesn't you know i think filler as you describe it with extra characterization that doesn't really always move the plot forward um is uh is good so like to end on it like almost everyone here has probably watched breaking bad um, is the, is the episode with the fly when Jesse and, um, Walter are stuck in this, in the, in the cooking basement, um, trying to get this fly that's, that's been around the room and they have, um, and they have a, like a heart to heart and a, and a bunch of stuff comes out a, like, you know, a little bit, a couple secrets they've been keeping from each other. That sort of thing is, is that, is that a filler episode? Cause it doesn't really move the plot forward in any way. It's, it's a chamber episode. Nothing really big happens. These characters like reveal a bit more about themselves and, and they, and they talk for like maybe a, a, a way that they haven't in a while, you know, like, um, is, is that a filler episode? Because I would say, no, it's actually one of my favorite episodes. So no, I don't know. Someone in the chat is saying yes because it it, it exists because they ran out of MIC. I I think that was a really good episode, so maybe it was filler and that was a good example of filler. Don't know. It's a really tough question and it's really hard and it's like I said it's even harder in video games. I think it's easier in someone like Celeste when it's not combat, it's arrangements of obstacles and different mechanics. The power up that you get that gives you your dash in the air and the 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 moving block, the the Kevin. Those can all be done in different arrangements and they can make sure like almost like just by comparing screenshots that this is in a different arrangement every single time and it's not repeating the same idea, you know? Like it's, it's definitely there. Whereas if they did another one, like um, at the end of uh, Reflection um, Seaside, um, there's like this really, really long, like super Meat Boy style um, spike tunnel that you have to get through. And I think that if, if they did another one of those immediately, I'd be like, oh, we're doing this again, you know, like, and, and that starts to feel like filler. So yeah. Okay, I think that's all I can say. I think I'm running out of steam a little bit here. Might have to go over on Tempic Games. Really, you don't get that, but that was really funny. You should laugh. I think I kind of get it, but I don't <laughs> fully get it. I get it a little. So I give you a smile instead of a laugh. Oh, okay. I like your smile, so mm. I'll take it. Let's talk about getting offended. Uh-oh. Not in terms of having bad opinions, but in terms of telling offensive jokes. James Gunn was fired and recently rehired over some edgy jokes from 10 years ago. Kevin Hart was disallowed to host the Oscars over similar jokes. Did they deserve this? Did they cross a line? Is there a line? Could you argue that offending people is part of a comedian's job description in addition to making them laugh? Should the phrase, I'm just joking, create an impenetrable criticism shield around the around the speaker how do you find the perfect joke that offends absolutely no one is there a common sense standard that should be applied to humor loaded you know what i feel like lily should answer this question <laughs> um okay so um there's none addressed to me this time because i'm not supposed to be here so i think that 
I, okay, so I, this is sort of political, and it's linked to the idea of of safe spaces and the safe spaces where you should try and create um, an, an area that you're not going to be exposed to anything that you might deem harmful because of your identity or maybe some of the decisions that you've made in your life and and that sort of thing. Um, there's probably some more nuance to safe spaces, but I don't know everything about them. Um, the reason why that's why I'm saying that is because um, ironically, I think that when a comedian is on stage and to some extent performing like they perform like on Twitter is hard like but definitely when they're on stage let's start there definitely when a comedian is on stage that's a safe space and I think that comedians should be allowed to say pretty much what ever the hell they want and have just immunity to it as long as you know it, it is clearly trying to be outrageous to get a laugh or it's it's supporting some some bigger point um however like they have to be comedians like like i can't just say whatever i want right now and then just be like oh i was just being a comedian for a second like like i, I can't do that like it has to specifically be a comedian in that spot for that i'm willing to give it just kind of just kind of blanket yeah that's fine because the comedian should be outrageous and they should push the boundaries but the issue that I, like when i was a kid i was really really into bill hicks and bill hicks would be offensive um nowhere near today's standards but like i think the most offensive he was was like he, he had a joke where he said you know um back when the the iraq war was going on um there was a there was a line that everyone would say uh and they kind of said it like up until recently too you know they were against the war but they were for the troops so it's like i want to support the troops but i'm against this war well one of the most outrageous things bill hicks would say was that he he said i'm for the war but i'm against the troops like he, he would say something like that you know like and he like there was one time when there was a um bill hicks is dead by the way like he, he died from i think pancreatic cancer I, I even read his uh biography i was that into him when i was younger um he wasn't the biggest comedian, but he but he was fairly prominent. Um, and anyway, so like there was a father and mother in the front row of the show, and one of their son had died in the Iraq War. And when he did this joke, he he said that like the the parents said something like you know you're you're a horrible person. Like my son died for your rights and everything. And 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 he kind of went off on them and was like your kid didn't die for anything and and like he didn't die for my rights at all. You know like you're you're a goddamn idiot if you think that's right. And to me, that's crossing the line. So. I think as soon as it becomes personal, it, it, it crosses the line. And but that doesn't mean that, that like comedians can't ever make shots at other people. It's just that they kind of like, I feel like they have to be people themselves. Like it, it can't be like some big ass comedian is like, like, like dunking on the guy that he saw at, at Walmart the other day with his full name that he's saying it. Like it's just someone else. But I, I also think that if they are, if a comedian is dunking on someone, like if, if, if Dave Chappelle like dunked on Louis CK, you know, like I kind of feel like Louis CK is, is allowed to be annoyed at Dave Chappelle, but Dave Chappelle should be allowed to say it, you know, like it, it and, and he shouldn't be like hated for it by other people as well. But like, you know what I mean? Like, I, I feel like there's a lot of, a lot of, like, particular things that need to be addressed in, in this sort of thing. It's, it's not, it's not easy. Um, but I do think that, that it is a comedian's job to push boundaries and, and to be offensive. But the reason why I'm bringing up Bill Hicks is not just because of that example that, that he did with, with where I think he was out of line, but it was also because I, I worshiped that guy when I, when I was a teenager, when I was a young impressionable kid, I worshiped that guy and I hung on his every fucking word. And I still enjoy his comedy. Like I haven't listened to it in a long time now, but when I did listen to it again, I, I still laughed. I found it funny, but like the whole time I'm like, wow, this guy is preachy as fuck. Like this guy is way too preachy. What the fuck, man? Like, like, like you need to chill the fuck out, Bill. Like, like, holy fuck. Um, and like, so like, I, I feel like if you if you give just like is it carte blanche is that the, the term like you just just immunity to, to to comedians to be able to do this sort of thing that there are gonna be oh no the kids die there there are gonna be um oh well rip kid there there are gonna be moments where you know there are impressionable to some extent kids and also impressionable adults what is this kid made of kid tanium like he's just he's taking more hits than me um that that are gonna that are gonna go on and repeat these these horrible things that the community might be saying just to just to get a laugh but th then that's a failure of the parents right the parents are letting them watch these things like like for the kids is just it's such a shitty thing to say and it shouldn't really be effective but it, it still is like like 
kids do still do these things. Down the face. <laughs> so as always, my answer is it depends. I I kind of feel like <sighs> outrage comedy and just saying something absolutely completely ridiculous is something that is something that I do sometimes on stream. But I'm I don't think I'm ever offensive about it. It's just some some ironic kind of like usually it's some it's kind of like fake hint that i'm into some weird kinky sex shit you know what i mean like that's that's kind of like like outrageous comedy but my, my outrageous comedy is never you know like like racist or, or sexist or anything else like that you know what i mean like it's it's not harmful to anyone except for myself you know and again i'm not a comedian so like if i did say that it wouldn't it wouldn't matter um i'm not in that safe space i'm not in that area but like i don't like the james gunn stuff i guess he was trying to be outrageous but like he he was making jokes about like being a pedophile and i just i don't even understand why he would do that like why, why would like like first like, i guess my, my biggest problem with it is that it's not funny like it's like it's not it's that it's offensive it's, it's just it's just it's is not funny at all and same with kind kind of like kevin hart what kevin hart said i i believe anyone can correct me if i'm wrong kevin hart basically said that he just he just hopes that his son isn't going to be gay and if he is he's going to beat it out of him like that to me that isn't that isn't a joke like even if you if you're trying to say like oh i'm just being outraged that doesn't seem like a joke to me that just seems like you're you just really hope that your son isn't going to be gay. Like where, like, where's the funny, right? Like, I, I don't, I don't, I don't understand. Right. Like my dad said that to me growing up and you know, he said like, I remember my mom said, I don't know why she said it to me. <laughs> Maybe she was worried. <laughs> She's like, you know, if, if, if you're gay, like you, you can tell us, you know that. Right. And, and me in, in one of my, my rare moments of, of being an adult before I was an adult said, like fuck no I wouldn't tell you and she was like really offended she was like why not and I was like because dad would beat the shit out of me if I said that and he was just sitting on the couch next to her and he kind of shrugged and went yep and and she she went off on him and I was like there you go you know like so like I don't I don't that's the problem and it's like is it is it just a really bad joke or is or is it not a joke and that's really hard to tell you know it, it really is hard to tell um, I could I could see it kind of being outrageous and everything. Well, how many but... jokes have a good a negative truth in them too, right? Like you see, like when you tell a lie, like a lot of the time there's there's like a morsel of truth in a lie. Yeah. So how much truth is in a, is in a joke? I don't think my dad would have beat the shit out of me. By the way, my 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 dad talked a loud game, but he he wouldn't have. We were we were hit a bit when we were growing up. Like nothing, we were never beaten. Like my dad was was hardcore. Like oh, you messed up. Here comes the belt. Like like back then, even in school, like the the schools were allowed to hit kids back then. Like when my dad was in school in in Britain, um, like we we got hit a couple times. And if I'm being one hundred percent honest, like we'll 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 never repeat that with our kids. But there were times where I got hit where I deserved it. And, and like, I, I like, even as an adult looking back, there were times when I didn't deserve it. And I'm still mad. Like, like, I'm still mad about, about like a couple of those times, but there were times where I can look at an adult, like, yeah, like, like I was really out of line that day and like, it, like, it's all right. Um, would have preferred him not to do that, but yeah, I, I can kind of see like what was going on. Um, but yeah, I was never like, like whipped or beaten with a belt or anything, but my dad was so like, like, um, yeah, I don't think he would. I don't think he would have done it. He made a couple of gay jokes himself growing up. His joke was that he would beat his son with a Barbie playhouse. Bad, but context. Huh. Okay, that's. I guess that's a little, a little better. Like it's. It's it's almost like making a joke like. I, he had the Barbie playhouse and I bought it for him and I didn't realize what it would do or I didn't realize that this was a this was a warning sign because I didn't want him to be gay like not that it would be a warning sign like like I, I'm trying to get into Kevin Hart's mindset like like we we, we bought the boys girls toys you know like because they wanted them you know like we're, we're not that kind of parent either you know even saying that they're girls toys is, is something I don't like saying it's just it's just easier for the sake of communication I don't I don't think there should be boys or girls toys I think you, you want to play with them what something you want to play with that like it's fine traditionally a girls toy let's 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 make some compromise there just for the sake of ease of communication like that makes it better but like I don't know like I, I really really don't know um, I don't like this is the question that, that we brought up earlier when it's about cancel culture like I, I really do feel like 
you say something bad and it's like like the whole the whole of the internet wants blood and then that's the end of it like you're you're fucking canceled like i just i feel like there isn't enough enough nuance for it like i i to get into like let's just go all in there have been times where like i really really do not like the donald trump as president okay let's let's put it that way let's go all in like i said i really do not like the donald, donald trump as president i i think that it's it's insane that that like it's like we we're talking about the simulations earlier that's a marker that something went wrong on this timeline okay this is like it's just insane to me um i can understand it you know like and, and everything but like it's just insane to me but like even saying that there have been times where i've been on reddit or something and like there's been a, a post or a comment and someone's been like donald trump said this fucking shitty thing or look at this picture of donald trump standing next to the pope and the pope looks miserable and now look at this picture of obama standing next to the pope and look doesn't doesn't the pope look so much happier to be standing next to obama and then you go and find the picture that you know wasn't selectively chosen and there's a picture of the pope standing next to obama looking miserable and there's a picture of, of the pope standing next to trump looking happy you know like like even knowing that it's just there's just complete bullshit that 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 both sides kind of throw at each other not not that oh, i said both sides oh that's it i'm done i'm canceled i'm canceled i said it like it's like i i i agree that if someone does something that is absolutely horrible and like just just horrid that yeah they should probably lose some of their prominence maybe even all of it if, if it's if it's that bad like i don't think there's any there's any coming back from like actually being convicted of rape but being accused of rape like years later with with no evidence like like that sort of thing like i i really i can't get behind that man like like i like there needs it needs to be rock fucking solid so like i'm in this awkward position where i agree with like believe all women because we're in this position now where you can't like you you ask like okay like 20 years ago this guy raped me and it's like well why didn't you come forward 20 years ago when there was to, to say it indelicately evidence and we could have we could have dealt with it then and it's like well because the climate back then was that no one believed women and it's like okay well we're not going to get past that until we start believing women so we're kind of at this contradictory point where we have to believe women but not convict the people they're accusing because we don't have any evidence but that means we shouldn't really ruin any lives because we don't have evidence so it, it's this weird really awkward point but we kind of have to go through that unless we, if we're ever going to get past it you know what i mean like like that sort of thing and that's how i feel about cancel culture and, and how we offensively is it really that bad like are we are we what's this boss it was right here are we are we going off of good information here oh it's, it's, the, it's the boss room from before only there's one of them this time and that's how i feel about like like a, like offensive jokes and everything like it's really hard to know but i do think that people are you know they, sh they should be more careful about what they say um especially on twitter when when they don't have what i consider to be like the the immunity of being a comedian comedian on stage for sure did kevin hart make that comment on stage like is is a comedian ever off stage now james kind of is, is not a comedian right he he just he just is a he's just a director sometimes a writer did he do any per performance comedy i'm not that familiar with james gunn one fungus ball harvested how many people have, have been cancelled so far that Jenny truly 100% ever did anything wrong though? Especially since the game James Gunn thing was actually organized by a crazy white wing weirdo and not any less people. Yeah, well, can 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 we believe that? I don't know. Like, is, has that been 100% confirmed? Can you even 100% confirm that? Like, the only thing we can go on there is that he, that he did say those things because they were still on Twitter as, as long as far as I know. Like, they, they've been verified and and that whoever was making the decisions had had thought they were bad enough that they should go. You know. And there's a lot of support coming out of uh, coming out for him and saying no, it should be fine. But then, like, um, what, what's what's the guy's name? Like, there was a lot of support for Roman Polanski. Like, uh, is that right person? Mm -hmm. Like, like Natalie Portman. Like, fucking supporting Roman Polanski. You know what I mean? Like, ooh. <sighs> didn't Woody Allen do something horrible too, or 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 is that just a little creepy? He he married his adopted daughter. Is that Woody Allen? He adopted a, a 16 year old girl and then he he married her later or is that someone else kevin hart wanted that joke to be on him as a father of how pathetic it is for a father to be like that in his joke yeah see that's the thing like it, that could be his intent but it didn't land that way and i i feel like that should you should be allowed as a comedian to take those chances robin williams um does a bit where he's on uh inside the actor's studio oh man i miss robin williams holy shit i'm still upset about that that and steve Irwin have hit me the hardest out of all the celebrity deaths 
a little bit of Chester Bennington too, but like Steve Irwin, I don't know, I don't know why I wasn't even the biggest Steve Irwin fan, but it's just just, just something about Steve Irwin just always made me always made me happy and smile. And, and Robin Williams is the same way, you know. Like anyway, um, like I I Robin Williams was on inside the actor studio with James Lipton, right? Like the soup, and he was um and he, and he he does a bit where he. He does a stand-up, like an improvisation and stand-up pit. It's actually really beautiful. If, if anyone hasn't seen that, um, go and watch that. Maybe watch the whole thing. It's interesting. And But at least watch that part where he, he does a, a, an improvised stand-up bit right there on stage in front of everyone. And he commentates it like as, as he goes through and he's like I, he, he has to every single time he's on stage he has to he it's just like a flurry of ideas coming in his head and he's just like bum 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 like he, he's arguably like like the king of improvisation improvisational comedy and he's just going through all these different things and then he, he gets to the end where like like he, he says a joke that's like a little out there and the audience doesn't laugh as much as the other ones and he's like and there I found the line and now I know where the line is so I need to bring it back a little bit like I've I've gone out to see it as far as I can these aren't his exact words I've gone out to see as far as I can with with how I can be and like it's like he's channeling this 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 thing and then I have to pull it back after that because now I know where the line is and now where I can't I can't cross over you know what I mean like and it's it's all about the audience you know certain jokes are going to land differently in, in different audiences and, and comedians usually prepare even for where they're going to be playing and they know that certain jokes aren't going to be received in the same way a lot goes into it like a ton and 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 they're gonna fuck up you know like they're gonna fuck up a lot, and it's, <sighs> yeah, I don't know. Anyway, I think I've rambled enough. I'm sorry, Micah. Uh, I would really like to talk about, in a video, <sighs> can art age? Like, can be something be good for its time? Because I've had some discussions with people that I consider very intelligent who disagree with me on this, and I just I just think it's, it's baffling. It's baffling that you could ever think that, um, all art should be held to modern standards instead of taking it under like what like the era that it was made and i'm not talking about anything uh close to political here like like the the, the climate the the cultural climate is made i'm talking about like the technological climate that it was made you know like um when when cavemen made their first paintings if that even is true that they made those first paintings you know i don't think we should be able to look back and go oh this is shit wow where where, where are these all these colors that we have now Stupid fucking smelly caveman! Wow, you you are just fucking so like that. That's just insane to me. You know what I mean? Like like we should <laughs> we should take it under consideration. You know when things were made, and the same thing goes for video games. Same thing goes for movies. You know, like we can look at something and be like, this is this is bad for now, but back then this was great. You know, and there have been people like I said I consider to be very intelligent and and have really good points on games that have said no this is bullshit you know it's if, if it was shit back then then it was always shit and I just cannot agree with that so a video on that would be pretty good um, because I feel strongly about it uh, but also I would like to do videos on things that aren't video games shock, shock and horror uh, I even wrote um, a fair amount and I would like to go back and finish it or maybe it is finished I can't I've written so much now I can, I can barely remember uh, but there was a video I was making on the Haunting of Hill House net, net, Netflix show uh, Lily and I even read the book so I would like to make that video uh, but I've learned over the past year and a half, maybe two years, I, I lost track of time a bit, um, that it matters a lot what you put on the channel, and if you get too many duds in a row, the channel can just die. Like, there are channels um, that have millions of subscribers, and I don't mean they have a million, I mean they really do have millions of subscribers, sometimes four or five millions of subscribers, that their new videos get less views than mine do. And I do not have anywhere close to a million subscribers, you know. Uh, in fact, I'm still a fair ways away from 400,000. Last I checked. So if you, this is this is from trying to focus on getting a lot of content out, probably because you, you get you get used to a certain level of ad revenue when you you do a new video. So it becomes more important to get more content out than it does to have good content out. Uh, not that the content is is bad. I'm not accusing anyone of like like rushing content out, but it's not content that they that the audience really really wants to see. And it's just like a death of a thousand paper cuts of you know just okay. Well, every single video is getting fewer and fewer views and less watch time than the ones before it. So YouTube the algorithm sees your channel as going downhill so it stops sending out notifications for your new videos so that can happen quite easily by accident even if you're working harder than ever so it's this 
it's this you know tug of war thing so then it's like okay we'll just put them on a different channel and you can have more freedom and then it's like yeah but that's taking away from main video time you know so yeah it's it's difficult um i keep hoping that we're going to get to the point where we're not going to be like that and be holding to that anymore and we're, we're probably there but uh there are things that i want to set up first before i can i can just take that risk and just be like i'm just going to make videos on whatever the hell i want now instead of trying to appease uh, my three reasons for doing something and that is uh do i think i have a lot to say about it um w will people want to listen and is it something that i will enjoy because i never go out of my way to to play a game that i think i'm not gonna like even with darkest dungeon you know i i thought i was gonna like that uh in no man's sky i wasn't sure so that's like my, my middle ground you know it, it, it it's not gonna be something like i'm really excited for it doesn't have to be that but at the same time it um it can't be something I know I'm gonna dislike, you know? That's that's my those are my rules. Uh, but we'll see. I right, kinda waffled there. Um I'm trying to think of any other topics I would like to do. But there have not been many customers videos on. Probably a lot of story stuff. Um I would like to do like just just a video that looks like videos that look on just like one mechanics or just just systems instead of having to do the big we're looking at the whole game, but again, that's not what the audience mostly wants. So it's it's the same problem as the other ones too. But I'm glad that you like those kind of videos. Uh, I feel like some of the past videos, maybe even the new ones have it too. I, I used to watch the videos back way more than I do now because um, my time just goes to just, just non-stop being Geralt right now and, and being even more of a dad than I was before. Uh, because back then it was, it was just Finn and now we have Leo and Kate. Uh, and having a house is much more time consuming than having an apartment. There's a lot more to do there. Um, but yeah, I used to watch the videos back quite often to see like, okay, well, what works, what doesn't, you know, I was, I was very much a, um, uh, f my own audience for, for trying to figure out what I liked and what I didn't like and I don't really do that as much now um, and I'd like to return to that but I feel like the older videos had more sections like what you're talking about where I will dive into a concept for like a few minutes maybe even 10 minutes and that doesn't really happen as much with the newer videos because it's so much focused on um, well, those on the game itself or I don't want to repeat myself from prior videos even if it's if it uh, even if it matches so I don't know but I could be wrong there I just rewatched your Undertale video where you said Undertale is more scary than all of her games you've played. Well, it, that that specific moment made me more scared than than pretty much every other horror game would today. When I was younger and a complete wuss, horror games scared me because the, the imagery and and that situation um, was was unsettling. Uh, and I think most people are going to feel that way when they first play horror games, and it's not until you play them enough and you die so many times that you realize, oh, okay. I think that even most people who disagree with me on that um, will at least agree that in something like Alien Isolation, when the alien has killed you enough times, because there were people who were like vehemently against my stance in chat when we were streaming Alien Isolation, and then after like uh, Alina had killed us like 30 or so times, I, I asked in chat, you know, like is the alien still scary for any of you here? And like my memory is pretty bad, but I'm I'm fairly certain that most people said no, like it it's done now, you know, like it can't be scary this many times, and just. I've played so many horror games that I'm now just at that at that stage right away when I start up a game that's like that, you know, like it, it might get me maybe at the very beginning when I haven't really like learned what kind of game it is yet. Like maybe there is some sort of severe punishment for death or anything. I'm always like kind of like, ah, maybe it's going to be, maybe it's not. But, you know, games like Evil Within where, you know, there's there's a chainsaw guy right at the start. I think he's a chainsaw guy and you, and you just die and it's like, okay, you're right back here. It's like, okay, well, this is all attention is just fucking gone. You know what I mean? So... Um, I, I, I just feel like I start there, whereas it takes, um, most players more deaths to get there because they just haven't played as many horror games as I have. It's, it's not like a, uh, like, oh, I'm right, you just take time to get there with me. It's just like, I, I just have more experience under my belt with this sort of thing, and I'm just expecting it sooner. Uh, maybe it's because I'm a, I'm a little more cynical than most, too, I don't know. But if we're talking about narratives, then, um, then then sure. Like, and visuals too. Visuals can be very, very unsettling. 
um, and stories can be very unsettling too. Uh, Soma is definitely a, a horror story, and I say so in the video. Like it's it's very effective as a horror story. It's it's quite possibly the the most effective horror story that I've seen, uh, at least in a game. Maybe, maybe period. There's some stuff in in Black Mirror that has freaked me out more. Um, I find that horror is much more effective with me if if what they're going through is is plausible. And I know that sounds kind of out there because, like, you know, like, how the, how the fuck is any of that plausible? But, you know, there's a difference between, um, scary ghost Freddy Krueger, man. You know, like, th there's no fucking way. Like, this is just not happening. But, you know, stretching it out significantly enough, Soma could happen. You know, like, that that is actually possible. You know, like, it's highly, highly unlikely. Same with all of the Black Mirror stuff. It, it's kind of possible. And that... That makes me think, you know? That, that gets to me a little bit more. Scariest episodes of Black Mirror? Um, probably White Christmas. And to some extent, White Rabbit. But probably White Christmas got to me the most. Uh, my favorite Black Mirror episode... I've only seen the first two seasons. My favorite Black Mirror episode is uh, the, the Merits one. Because it speaks to me as a YouTuber. It's, it's, it's eerily eerily like the most plausible out of out of all of them and you have to accept that there's there's some metaphor being used with the way that they um like the job is to to go on an exercise bike you know it's not literally an exercise bike you have to it's just it's just the daily grind and that's what it is it's literally a grind like you have to you have to accept that, that it's not actually just hey go in this arcade and pedal and that's your job um but yeah that one's probably my favorite because it's just it just speaks to me like really clearly but yeah, White Christmas is the is probably the scariest one. For the last scene. Just the last thing that happens and no, it's it's the second last scene, isn't it? The last scene is with John Hamm. Um the second last scene I think is a scary one. Um if you've seen it, it's uh what what the, the police officer does in the second last scene. Um just just kind of thoughtlessly thought it's just thoughtless horror you know what i mean like it, there's, it's just vindictive thoughtless horror and it's like yeah we would we would totally do that like people people would do that that is something a human would do no doubt in my mind that is something a human would do um and yeah that that really really got to me i have a couple questions about a couple games you might have heard of before not sure they're kind of niche games do you have plans on playing covering making a video on sekiro <laughs> shadows die twice <laughs> And if so, can you divulge on such plans? And if not, why not? So yeah, there was almost a video on Sekiro released already. And sometimes I think that maybe I should have done it and just, just powered through. Um, but like I've hinted to a couple times on stream before, uh, I'm kind of losing my mind a little bit and it's really not a joke. Um, the, the Witcher video is this, it's like trying to juggle too many balls in the air at once. And I'm really good at juggling balls and handling balls in general, but uh, this is the first time in my life that I feel like there's there's more balls than I can hold. And even just the thought of having to do another really exhausting, grueling video editing session on something that, and then going into that big thing, you know, like right back to it when it's already like taking up all of my mind, I feel like I might break a little bit. Um, it's, it's really not good. Like I'm trying to downplay it a bit in streams and everything and, and not go too much detail because I don't want to come across as whining or anything. But yeah, it's 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 not it's not good at the moment, and uh, it's not helped by the fact that like bar none, even this stream, every single stream that we do, or almost every single day on Twitter or on Discord, there's there's someone asking me, hey, when's the video going to be done? You know, and that's a good thing. It's it's really good that people are so interested and so invested in everything, and I and I understand that it, it took it's, it's taken too long, but. Uh, when it comes out, I think people will understand that, you know, it didn't take too long at all and it's like, holy shit. Uh, but I, I do feel the pressure a bit and uh, I'm, I'm nervous, let's put it that way. Not handling it well at all. Um, anyway, but to answer your question, yeah, there was going to be a video on Sekiro. I have the script written. Um, I think I even have it recorded. That's how off I am. I don't even remember if I recorded it or not. Um, I have, I think, about two terabytes of footage. I can't remember how, how much I have. It's a significant amount, though. Um, it's all in 1440p. I played it through, I think, five times, but uh, it's really, really easy to play that game all the way through because uh, it's so 
not only is it faster than any other game that from has made and like like the souls like games that they've made not only is it so much faster to get around it's also um there's no real reason to kill anything you know like you don't get experience from it really you do get the skills but the way i was playing that game there were, there were only like a handful of skills that i even found useful and and then they were just like yeah i guess i'll guess that that would be a little bit of a bonus there are some skills that are really important in that game and are game changing um for sure but uh they come most of them come much later when you can just grind out skill points accidentally just by killing a few of the big monsters and some of the bosses um so yeah it's it's really really easy to just get through that um that game so i played it through quite a bit i i, I got decent at it um yeah and there was there was going to be a video um so yeah, there still will be a video that's the only other one that i'm promising right now after after witcher is done i will do the Sek sekiro video and then i'm just going to take a break unless i just collapse after the witcher video is done then i guess the Sekiro video is going to be a little bit after that but we'll see uh most of that work's already done i just i will probably play it again just to make sure and then do another pass on the on the, the script even if i do have to re-record it and then that video will be out uh, i think it was about an hour long is, is the amount that i had and i speak about i don't speak about the story uh part apart from in passing um it was a lot about the um the gameplay uh there was a lot of criticism about the the enemy variety um boss variety and level layout and theme variety i felt like the game didn't do that well at all and there was a lot more that I could have done about it. There was a lot of talk about the successes uh, of the of the combat system and how defense is offense in that game, and it's somehow the most defense-oriented game that they've made that's a Souls-like, but it's also the most aggressive at the same time because defense is offense, um, that a lot of people don't fully like view the stamina bar correctly in my opinion that uh there's a lot of people think oh well you, you have infinite stamina to do all your attacks or anything well not really because you have to manage your stamina for for defense and it's the same kind of thing it's just that you can chain your attacks together a lot smoother it's a really genius system i like it a lot and i hope that it gets um a sequel because it doesn't look like it's getting dlc uh yeah i, I really enjoyed sekiro um but it's also the game that they've made in, in that um in their souls like area that has the least amount of replay value uh, I don't think I ever really want to play Sekiro ever again, uh, except for the, for the video. Maybe if there's a sequel announced, or maybe years from now when I've forgotten a lot of it and I've forgotten a bunch of the timings. But uh, that is like there are no real other build options. Um, you, you can technically find different build options if you push it with the with the prosthetic. Originally, I thought there was more build choices because of that, but then I actually did a playthrough where I used the prosthetic more. I was like, yeah, this is this is just a bonus off of the same core moveset. Um, so I think they could have made the game a lot better if they had included maybe two or three more uh, move, uh, movesets, move weapons. Not as much as Dark Souls or Bloodborne, just two or three. And um, I know that would have been quite a bit of work considering how the animations work in that game for responding, for, especially enemies responding to different attacks, but I think they could have done it. Uh, the big one to get right is just that the deflection has to work the same way in all the weapons, and I think they could have made that happen. Um, but yeah, I was I was disappointed in that part of the game for sure. Can make it impossible. For sure. Uh, but it has a lot of really great moments. I don't want to spoil them, but uh, so in vague terms, if you played the game, the the last new area that you get to, I think I think it has to be the last one. I think you have to go to all the other areas before you go to um, the 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 azure temple that should be enough uh is just absolutely gorgeous and it's it's one of the best moments ever in in the games that they've made and arriving there just like i had to pick my jaw up off the floor afterwards i was like what the fuck i even went and got lily and showed it to her and she was like wow this might actually rival bloodborne you remember saying that because bloodborne's your favorite for, for yeah, the visuals I remember. That, was, that was really beautiful yeah it just the, the the cherry blossoms there and everything just just absolutely just gorgeous um it has the best Best two end bosses that I think that they've had in those kinds of games with the difficulty on the on the last boss being just about perfect I think that's the, that's the only time that they've nailed that it's it's not too hard but it's not too easy um, yeah it's it's really really good um, the optional final boss which is usually harder than the other ones I, I don't think was harder this time so maybe it was a different approach and I like that boss a lot but um, I knew it was my favorite for a while, but now I've kind of cooled on that boss a little bit, and I feel like it goes on for a little bit too long. 
uh, which is weird because most of my criticisms of, of the past souls like that they've made have been uh, bosses can die just way too fast if you're if you're keeping up with your gear and you're and you're upgrading your weapons uh, but for that one it, it seemed to be the opposite problem it, it goes on for uh, for a bit too long with uh, hatred without without spoiling it by just saying it that if you played the game you know what I'm talking about yeah but this the the combat system was good uh, it did have you know the, the typical from software problems there were a lot of shitty hitboxes there were a lot of really bad animations that just kind of go out of nowhere um, there are spear guys in the game that will do a sweeping attack that you have to jump over and there are certain spear guys in the game that if you jump over their spear attack, the sweep, they immediately snap to a thrust with absolutely no telegraph, no warning, and no like no way to know it's coming at all. It's just like the game just decides, hey, we're going to do this attack now in response to your jump. And the only way to, to avoid it is that you have to parry in the air after you do the jump before they even do the switch the attacks like you have to know it's coming you have to be prepared for it and you just have to say yeah i think he's gonna do it and you just have to fit the deflect, deflect um and then you can get through it yeah it's just there's, there's just a lot of the usual kind of bullshit and i feel like they're getting worse with every game when it comes to refinement of these things but they're also getting better with how the combat system works in general so is that worth the trade-off honestly i think no but um you know for, for longevity and for making a good game like especially considering that these problems could probably be fixed with i'm gonna say three months of extra development and polish time at the end i feel like from software doesn't do that enough they get their they make their games really really fast and it, it feels like they like like kind of like how i answer these questions it's just like take a deep breath and just go whoa, 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 whoa. and then at the end they just like okay i'm done exhale and then they just move on you know so to make it a writing thing they don't edit enough there's definitely some editing there's definitely some play testing but nowhere near as much as they should uh imo and that you can see that in all of their games especially dark souls 2 and sekiro um bloodborne might be the most polish and I wonder if that's because it's a Sony exclusive and Sony takes that a bit more seriously. I don't know enough about how they work with their exclusives to say for sure, but but yeah. So writers are hijacking Hemingway's Iceberg Theory without knowing what the iceberg actually looks like. <laughs> so Iceberg Theory from, from Hemingway um, is not something I'm, I'm all that familiar with, but the general idea is that the story should have should just present you the tip of the iceberg and you should be able to uh, infer the rest of the story from that and there should be a lot more to explore and think about from from just the tip that you present to the, to the reader am, am i correct is my memory somewhat close or am i way off i would say yes i would say that if, if that's true then i would say then that's correct yeah a lot of a lot of writers and date game developers are are taking that that mode and they aren't really uh doing enough with it they're not they're not justifying it i also think that lost has kind of ruined a lot of media for a bit and maybe that effect has gone too like are we ever going to get over lost so maybe it's it's uh it's it's similar to to dark souls for for tv it's just the lost format of we have the all these mysteries to to string you along and then every single episode we're going to have a, an individual mystery with a character and we expand on this character's side story and uh maybe mostly with flashbacks but with that are relevant to current events and you know like we're just going to tell the story and what's the answer well we don't know we hope we hope that we figure out the answer before we get to the episode where we have to make it matter that's that's the lost format and i see a lot of shows kind of going with the lost format and uh, i really like lost but uh i didn't like the ending um, but i've heard that if you start lost after like now um it's more satisfying it was the the uh the the allure of needing to have information that kind of ruins it and the ending is okay if you like lost for the characters i think that the ending is pretty good but if you like lost for the mysteries and the story then it's not going to be it's not going to be satisfying and I think that a lot of uh, a lot of writers have fallen into this trap now, and I'm noticing it with a lot of um, it's like it's like a short story structure. So here here in my mind is a is the, the perfect way that you write a story with a twist. It doesn't have to be a book; it can be TV or anything. So a twist should be something that happens at the end of Act Two. It should not be something that happens at the end of the story. So a lot of writers now will give the twist 
at the end like like the the big like perception changing twist they will they will put it at the very 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 end of the story as almost like a gotcha on the last line of the last page you know and that to me can be interesting there's always ways to make something work but i don't like that you need to expand on that at the end you know like there needs to be another act where you explore this and and be like oh okay like well, what does this mean where are the repercussions what's going to happen to these characters now where does the story go on after this big revelation sometimes it can work as as the end of a of a, of a story if there's going to be another one in the series like empire and to return of the jedi you know what i mean but there's a lot of stories now that are uh just they do that and it's just a, a contained story and that and that's it so like a perfect example of something not doing that that, that me and lily both love is gone girl gone girl um i think spills its twist at the end of act one like it does it even earlier and it's like holy shit you know like and it, it builds on it and that's kind of like I, I hate to say this but not really because i just love bringing it up to pour salt in the wound that's kind of why i didn't like the ending of silent hill 2 because silent hill 2 does that silent hill 2 reveals its twist not at the very very end but like within the last 20 minutes and it's like okay well i feel like if that was if that was in any other media it, it would be it would be criticized more heavily as the okay and then you know like what happened after that you know like this should be the act two thing what are we going to do after this you know like and like no it's over um and that's how that's why i feel like it, one of the reasons why it was disappointing so yeah i won't spoil gone girl don't worry uh if you're not someone that likes to read a lot um, I think Lily will agree with me on this. The movie is just as good, right? Like Gone Girl? Almost. I, I like the book slightly more because it's told in a different way. So it's not so much the story, it's how they tell the story. Careful with spoilers. I'm not saying anything more. Okay. But like, it's it's not... To me, there's like... Th there's just two great things about about stories, right? And it's it's like the plot and then there's the method for how how it is told. And I I like the book just a little bit more because it comes across better, I think that way. But the casting for the movie was just incredible. Oh, like, the casting was spot on. Like, oh, man. There's a line in the book that says, you know, that, that uh, Nick, oh. Nick yeah. has a face that you just want to punch. And when I think of that, I think of Ben Affleck. No offense to him, but yeah. he does have a face that you just want to punch. And But still handsome, you know yeah. what I mean? Like, like, it's like, yeah. kind of charming in a you want to punch him kind of kind, way kind, you know? kind of goofy your life has been so easy fuck you kind of way even yeah. though that's not true of Ben Affleck from what I know yeah like the, the perfect and, and Rosamund as, as Amy is just like wow Silent Hill 2 is a game it works so well maybe maybe it's because you're meant to replay it and maybe that's meant to be in the other act but I don't know I don't I don't think that's that's true but yeah do you think it's starting to become an issue with gamer discourse that a game can't exist without bettering the industry or making extra time money? Is that true? If that is true, then yeah, I think that's a problem, but I don't know if that is true or not. The bettering the industry thing is bullshit. Like, like games can just be entertainment. There are plenty of movies and plenty of books. You know, all other media doesn't have this issue. Um, I do agree that, that games can be political. There's no problem with games being political. That's, you know, like... I, I disagree that everything is political, you know, there are these people are like everything, every single action is political, so you can't get away from it. It's like, you know, when I get up in the morning and I brush my teeth, that's not a political act. Um, like if you want, if you want to argue that uh, about status quo and everything, and therefore every act is, is a political act, and that just means that the word just has no meaning anymore. Um, so I disagree with that. But I do think that games can be political just fine. There's no, there's no issue with that. But I also think that every game doesn't have to be political. It's fine to not be political. You know, you don't have to do that. Um, but there seems to be this push about making games political and focusing a lot on the politics of games in order to legitimize the industry a little bit. And um, I don't know what what's the cause of that, if it's insecurity about games being viewed as for children or if there isn't really that many that many good talking points about games for a lot of critics and reviewers to dig into like there are in other, in other media, you know? Um, but I would say that that isn't really a problem with the industry, that's just a problem like in, in terms of um, the reviewers and the critics. I think that's a problem that the games just aren't there yet and gaming storytelling in games is just not mature enough to deal with that yet so we have people really really reaching um uh, uh, for things to criticize about you know let's talk about colonialism in tomb raider it's like what you know like this this, this isn't the kind of game that's it's like that you know um so yeah i i feel like there's it's it's coming from a good place but it's the media just isn't there yet
and it's kind of like, you know, square block through the triangle hole. Some of the conversations can still be interesting though, even if they are flawed. Just because the game is not not intended that way doesn't doesn't some political assumption is not present in the game making though? What? That's why I'm sympathetic to all games that are political messages. How is Baba is you a political message? This my my go-to for this is usually because uh, people say this argument quite a bit to me and they say you know all all art is political and it's like how is starry night political how is a landscape painting political and then you're then they're in the awkward position of almost saying that landscape port uh, landscape portraits landscape paintings aren't art you know like where's the politics there I, I will want to clarify, I agree that most art can be or is political because it, it's like even, you can even make an argument for something as simple and, and, and seemingly innocent as, as Mario being, having political, you know, reinforcing the political status quo. But yeah, Starry Night is not a good example because Van Gogh painted that from a mental hospital and you could view that as his view of the world as a commentary on mental hospitals back then. Yeah, but if you say that, then, then I have to agree. I have to concede the point that yes, all art is political because now you're not making it about the art, you're making it about the artist. And that, that's now we're talking about people and politics is, just has to be there. You know, like where were they? What kind of life did they have? What kind of privilege did they have? What kind of privilege did they not have? Yeah, for sure. Then, then you know, if you take that view, then yeah, it is. But I don't... I don't think that's what people are saying when they say all art is political, so I can't agree with that. That seems like a, that seems like a nonsense statement to me because it's like okay, well, it's like yeah, duh, but that doesn't like now you're gonna be like digging for all the meaning in it, you know? Like you have to. It's more about the artist and not the art itself. I feel like there's also a really big reason why a lot of artists are just choose a pseudonym so the politics and predetermined ideas are extracted from the art. Yeah, that's a fair point too. Yeah, especially if they want. Uh, the points to speak for themselves, you know? There's the autobiographical fallacy that a lot of uh, writers fall into. I think one of the, the classic examples that I learned about was a, a writer having a main character that was hardcore vegan and they met someone who had written the book and they were like, really enjoyed that character and it was so cool to see that vegan character and they were represented in, in your book. And then, you know, the author pulls out a ham sandwich and starts eating it and the, and the fan is like, Whoa, what the fuck, you're not vegan? What the fuck, what the and, and like that sort of uh, made up exaggerated example, but that, that pretty much, you know, encapsules the autobiographical fallacy right there. So there's definitely some merit to that. Wait, is Joseph not a, not a dragon? Is Joseph even a Joseph? Ooh. It's the beginner's guide all over again. You can't make assumptions about the author from product they made. Yeah, I, I agree with that. That's the, the autobiographical fallacy. But a lot of authors do want you to do that. So that's where it comes murky in there. And that's why there are no rules to art, you know? Like, there really aren't. There, there are no rules to art, so. That's why it's, it's it's so much fun. And I mean that genu genuinely. It's so much fun to discuss it. It can mean so many different things. Would you fuck the dragon in your profile pic? Ooh -hoo. No, I wouldn't. I wouldn't fuck a dragon. I think people are people confusing the fact that from all art, you can extract a political interpretation and claim that all art is political instead. Maybe. I mean, I, I still think that you're you're not going to get a political interpretation from a landscape painting. I, I, I just don't think it's possible. I don't think you're going to get a political interpretation from uh, Baba's You. Uh, eh, is, is philosophy, like, th th that kind of deals with... No, it really doesn't. The, the trailer, I'm getting confused with the trailers. The trailers kind of kind of hinted that Baba is You would have this sort of existential kind of crisis kind of feeling to it, and it really doesn't. Sorry for spoiling it. It really doesn't. There's, it's just a puzzle game. Um, I want to say Tetris, but does Tetris have... Like, te Tetris has... Eh... I just think Russian and I think political, so I'm being kind of racist, so sorry about that. Uh, Tetris Attack. Does, does Tetris Attack have, you know, politics? Like, I don't think you could. I think that's in the same reason, same area as, um, as landscape paintings, you know? But, you know, land, uh, portraits of people, suddenly you can be like, okay, well, they, they chose to depict this person in some way. Um, the fact that this person was worth having their their their, their portrait taken, you know what I mean? That sort of thing. But I definitely think there, there are some forms of art and some examples of art that, uh, that can't be political or politicized at all 
or interpreted politically in any way without talking about the artist and the developer or the creator and at that point you're not talking about the art anymore IMO. If Lily became a video game critiquer on YouTube and became infinitely more successful than you, would you concede a small part of you would be envious? Um, yeah, I think so for sure. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so I think that, okay, we talked about racism a little bit, so let's talk about how I'm sexist. So I, there's a little part of me that that it that it was brought up in like a like with some sexist ideals and one of those sexist ideals that is ingrained in me is that the man should be should provide more than than the woman and there were times in the past where uh lily made more money brought in more money than i was and i felt like a, a complete failure whenever we were in in those stages you know what i mean so um and that's not right of me i i i know that's sexist and i'm and I, and I know i shouldn't feel that way but i know for sure that if we went back to that um it would bother me a little bit probably not as much as other people but um at least i hope so <clears throat> but it would it would bother me a little bit yeah So sorry. Used to be uh, used to be worse, but I've gotten over a bunch of uh, a bunch of that. He is self-aware. I don't think it's necessarily sexist. Maybe yeah. M maybe it's sexist to think it's sexist. Maybe it has nothing to do with uh, to do with the sexes. Maybe it's to do with like I want to be, I, I want to contribute more. Like I, I don't go to work anymore, and I feel kind of weird about it still. So, like I contribute in other ways, but. I wouldn't say, I don't know if I'm envious, but maybe I am a little envious that you have the channel. Because you contribute now, like, it's all you, if you're the one financing everything, whereas, you know, I used to, but now I help, but it's not the same, you know, as when I was bringing in an actual paycheck, you know? Yeah, it's but different. I, I view it as, as being enabled by you. And I know, I know how you do. Yeah. We've talked about this. I'm just saying, like, I, I don't see it as how I feel is because you're a man that you're bringing in the money, and I feel envious because, you know, I'm, I'm just a female who's not. I see it as kind of a human thing, you know, that you both kind of want to be equal. You know, you both kind of want to help and contribute and be a part of it, you know? Like, like I'm helping right now at 2.22 in the morning, so I am helping. <laughs> but, and, you know, it's not a paycheck with, with benefits anymore, you know what I mean? It's, it's a little bit different now. It's more culturally sexist than personally? Yeah, probably. Boomer Joe in a Zoomer world. Oh, that's an interesting question or an interesting point. Like, if I died, you'd inherit the channel. So let's ask them because we've spoken about this a, a couple times because mm. we're we're more big fucks. So let's just pull them. Let's just let's just 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 open the open the the floor to to chat. So if, if I if Joe died, went to the corner store tonight to get some milk, and he got hit by a bus, how should Lily cash out? How how does Lily maximize? Because I can't make videos anymore, and Lily can't take over, so it's effectively done. So how how should Lily cash out? Should should she immorally just not say anything for as long as possible, <laughs> so no one knows, or do does she? She has laryngitis. He can't talk. Do, so. does, does she like say it and hope there's some sort of fundraiser or like? Like what? Like what did? What does Lily do? What do you think, Chat? And this is not pre-recorded, and I'm not already dead. I'd watch a Lily review. Ooh, you could just start, start doing that. Yeah, just upload videos to the same channel. But I have to play the games, and I don't know if I. Can... Maybe it doesn't have to be games. Maybe it could be something else instead. Mm. Do you know I was what I wanted to make when when we uh, when we first started making the channel? I thought about this, and I still might do it because it's just such. It's just such a, a crazy idea, and I really want to do it. Remember when we were in um, we were in a really shitty apartment, and we had bed bugs. I think I've spoken about this on on stream once before, and um, the whole building had bed bugs. Every single unit had bed bugs, and I found a way to get rid of the bed bugs by following a really like like lesser known online tutorial. And I was at the um, the store one day. And uh, I was speaking to one of our one of our neighbors, and they were like, "Yeah, the the fucking bed bugs. I had to throw out like fifteen thousand dollars worth of furniture to get rid of them." And I was like, "I just told him like, oh, I just did this," and he looked at me like I was a fucking wizard. And I was like, That's "Oh man." True. Yeah, you did get rid of them. And, and we didn't have to throw out everything. And it's like, 
I, I know it's becoming more of a problem. Apparently, they're coming back now. The bed bugs used to be a really bad problem in the 40s and the 50s, I think, and then they went away, and now there's more and more people are having them. I was like, if I ever get big on a channel, I'm gonna do a PSA and I'm gonna, I'm gonna like widespread my get rid of your bed bugs tutorial. I'm gonna, and I'm gonna do it. I think I still might. But yeah, you could do that. You could do that sort of thing. You know what? They're saying anime. Maybe I would watch anime and I would actually talk about anime because that would be a really good way to cash in, wouldn't it? Maybe. Because then I wouldn't really have to play games and I would still kind of like hit a lot of your audience with the anime. What Lily's did I, waifu channel. What did I do to get rid of them? Um, I made uh, some traps with like like really really cheap materials so you get a you get like a two liter bottle of um soda empty bottle and you fill it up with warm water and yeast uh and you pour sugar in it to activate the yeast and then you put a ziploc bag over the the top of the bottle like an open ziploc bag um that goes about that like drapes down like halfway over the the top of the, the the soda bottle and then you put that inside a tupperware container that's large enough to to house the 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 whole bottle and you tape paper towel to the to the outside edges of the tupperware so what this happens is that bed bugs are attracted to you from carbon dioxide emissions that from from you know inhaling and exhaling and the yeast in the sugar water uh the warm sugar water activates and creates carbon dioxide that will get trapped in the ziploc bag and then will flow downwards out of the opening into and around the tupperware trap and then the bed bugs can climb up the the uh, paper towel that's uh taped to the outside of the tupperware container but then they can't climb back out again because they can't. Their their little evil Nazi hooks can't get um, can't get out of the tasseled Tupperware. And and that's it. That we I put like four of those traps around the house around the apartment. Um, and it's it just smelled like a brewery in there for a little while. And there were fucking hundreds, maybe even thousands of the fuckers that went into the into the uh, into the traps. And that was it. They were gone forever after that. They never came back. Um, and that got rid of them. That got rid of them. And it's really cheap to make, too. You just have to put up with the smell. There's probably an even better way of doing it. Like, I saw all these tutorials, and they're like, I just I just sleep on, on a plastic sheet. <laughs> I was like, what? Like, yeah, I just sleep on a plastic sheet. Because I, 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 I try to put a plastic sheet over all my bed posts. And what the fuckers do is, is that they they climb up the wall, go on the ceiling, mm -hmm. and they Tom Cruise down from the ceiling on top of you onto the bed. So what I did was, is that I just sleep on a plastic sheet, and every morning I get up and I kill all of them that came on the plastic sheet when they landed on me. And you know they bit me all night, but that doesn't matter. I just I just fucking just you know dealt with it for weeks, and eventually I had just killed them all because they get stuck on the plastic sheet, and I'm like, what? <laughs> So that there must be a better way. So then I found I found uh, I found that tutorial and I tweaked it a little bit it was for my own life ends. Saving. That yeah. was a game changer. Just sleep in a room without a ceiling on my own. Yeah, exactly. Then you hear a little like bed bug sized helicopter. What if they could fly? Don't even don't don't say right. that. Oh by the way, I level I, I leveled up my dad's skill yesterday, chat. Um I killed a spider with my bare hands twice. Usually I, I used to like run for a tissue or something and be like, I don't want to touch the spider in case it bites me, but now, no, I just kill spiders with my bare hands now. I'm like, fuck it. I don't give a shit. Landlord didn't do much for us there. It was a pretty, uh... I'm that much of a dad. Shit apartment. There was one spider that I saw on the floor here and it was going into uh, the kids' room, I think. So I killed it while I was on the floor because I, I didn't want to risk running a tissue in case, you know, I, I lose sight of it and then I don't know where it is, you know? I didn't have a spotter for me, so I, I just killed it with my bare hands. And then uh, I went downstairs, I opened the back door to go on the back deck for something, and there was a spider on the outside of the door when I opened it, and it was much bigger than the other one, I, and I just smushed it before it could get away, before it could get inside the hoose. One, not, not a spider, I think it was like a neighbor. I hate them so much. Are you making dad noises yet? Is that is that a letter Kenny Whoa, reference? Because if it is, I got that reference, and you're going to be so happy that I got that reference. Yeah, I, I make dad noises. Oh god, I hope that's the letter Kenny reference. At least you bought spider donut? Exactly. Just keep a lid on a Pringles can on my desk and toss them outside. 
Yeah, I shouldn't kill them. I should try and get them outside, but I don't know if I'm, I'm such a high-level dad yet to pick up a spider and take it outside. Like, s smushing it, it's over real quick. I had to kill one. And I took it outside and, like, flung it on the porch, but it kept trying to come back in. <laughs> Like, I'm, sh I'm sure this is gonna shock so many of you, but I'm kind of neurotic and if a spider bit me I, I would be like it's gonna it's gonna be venomous. It's gonna be necrosis. It's gonna kick in I'm gonna lose my thumb, you know, like it's it's gonna be like so yeah I just I just I'm not there yet And then you would die and then I would have to take over the channel and Exactly full circle death by spider bite. The spider. Do you think I'm neurotic? Am I neurotic? Yeah. Yeah? Oh my god. Well, I'm a little neurotic, and you're more neurotic than I am. Really? You think I'm worse than I you? I think you're worse than Oh god, I'm really neurotic then. Oh god. What are your thoughts on representation? And media and forced diversity can be in games, books, films, etc. So, I don't really think that forced diversity is that bad. I, I'm... <sighs> okay. Does forced diversity exist? Absolutely, yes. It's it's inarguable that it exists because we are living in, in a material world and I'm a material girl and there are going to be people who are in charge of making decisions who think that putting diversity in their stories, their games, their movies, whatever, is going to win them points and the points are going to be used to get more money, more profit, and there's probably investigations or workshops or studies or whatever they're called, focus group tests, I think that's it, that have been done that have proven, hey, if we do this, it's gonna it's gonna do that. And there's gonna be, there might even be focus groups that have done looped around and be like, okay, if we do this, there's gonna be outrage and outrage and outrage uh, has sales and, and it's and it's a really good thing we should definitely do it um so yeah i it's definitely a thing but i think in almost all cases it it's not really that big of an issue it's not that big of a deal so what what's the opposite of forced diversity forced normativity so this is something that that i try to fight against when i write which is that there's this assumption that, that a lot of people make, even even if they're gay, that when they're when they're consuming a piece of media, that every single character that they see in, in a piece of media is heterosexual until proven otherwise. And some people go the other way and they like to be like, okay, every character is homosexual until proven otherwise. They default to whatever they are. But most characters in media are heterosexual. So they think, okay, they're, they're gonna be, just assume it until they find out. Um, and coming from a heterosexual male, when I write characters, the, when unless there's a reason for it that I, that I need to go, that I need to address going in, um, most of the characters when I write them start as a default as a heterosexual male. You know, because that's the perspective that I'm writing from, and to fight against that, as as kind of hackneyed as this is, um, I assume that any character that I write now, I get into this mindset that any character that I that I write is bisexual until proven otherwise, and is female. That's that's what I that's what I default to, and by defaulting to that, I found that the characters in my books have a lot more diverse diversity between men and women like that that alone you might think that, that means i have way more women than men but it actually doesn't it it, it it balances out about 50 50 because then i realize okay i actually need this character to be a man for whatever reason uh, you know it might be a really like unimportant reason but i kind of need the character to be a man in this slightly slight way so therefore um it's no longer a long, longer woman and that makes it about 50 50. um so that's that's how i i try to skew that and some people might think that is forced diversity some people might not like what i just said because they are viewing that that a character isn't isn't informed by or built off of their sexuality or their or their sex and that's kind of why i don't want to answer the other question because my probable co probably controversial opinion is that your sex isn't your personality and your sexuality isn't your personality
and I really don't want to say any more than that because it's a really difficult topic to get into, but that's how I feel. It definitely can be, especially in real life, as opposed to, you know, when you're writing media and it's like when you're writing a book and a story, it's unless it's really, really about real life, you know, like your characters aren't really going to be that informed by that. They're, they're going to be characters for your own design and for your own reasons. Um, and that's what I try. That's what I try to do. And that's where I, I kind of sit against it a little bit. So yeah, that's 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 what I think. Um, but I think forced diversity is is mostly fine. You know, like it's when have there, especially in video games, when has there ever been a video game where it was really really important that the main character was a man, or the main character was white? or anything really like is it really important that this character is a woman or this character is black or asian or anything is it really important this character is straight is it really important this character is gay and i, I would say that you would struggle real hard to get to a hundred characters in all video games where that is important i i i'm i, I really and 100 myself oh, that's a that's a lot but there's a lot of video game characters there's a lot so i think that there are definitely characters that that it matters um I think even sometimes maybe not in really, really important ways. Could Joel be a woman? And could Ellie be a son? Could, could that be inverted? I think it could. I, I really think it could. Could Joel be a woman and could Ellie still be a girl? And and Joel's daughter at the beginning. Could that, could that it could be the same scenario, but Joel is, is a girl, you know? I, I think I think it could work. However, would it work as well? You know, with the story that they want to tell, with with this slightly different relationship that that fathers have with their daughters, especially a single father in that case. You know what I mean? Like, I, I feel like that's somewhat important to the story. It's not integral, but it's somewhat important to the story, and that would change the story. But that's like, I would really struggle to get to a hundred. 100 characters i think and that there are a lot of characters in video games in all of them so that's what i think so it, it to me force diversity is it feels a little icky sometimes but only because of that reason that i said at the beginning i don't like it because i feel like almost every time it's someone trying to some executive trying to to make more money by scoring woke points and that's what i don't like i don't it's not the diversity part itself that bothers me it's just it just seems so dishonest sometimes but i mean i would probably struggle to really to really name like off the top of my head where i think it is like that it just it just kind of you just watch a trailer or something and you're just kind of like uh this feels wrong you know what i mean and th the problem with with feedback on the internet is that i feel like a lot of people just default to that when they see anything that isn't what they consider the norm so it kind of it gets into this feedback loop which i really don't enjoy but yeah that's how i view it and i think i'm not going to say anything more than that sorry because i i i don't want to get into into dicey areas but that's that's how i feel and hopefully that's okay